Leviticus 18, getting back into our study. I've been eager to get back into this, and uh, I think we needed a little bit of a time away from Leviticus for the sake of redundancy, but I'm excited about getting back into it and completing, so as long as the Lord wills, completing the book uh, by some consecutive sermons here. Leviticus 18, let's look at... The book in verses, let's look at verses 1 through 5, and then we'll look at 24 through 30. Let's stand, if you will, in honor of the reading of God's Word. Leviticus chapter 18. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, shall ye not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, shall ye not do. Neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. Ye shall do my judgments, and keep mine ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, shall he, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. Now he goes on to list sins of a sexual nature, including incest, adultery, homosexuality, bestiality, between verses 1 through 5 and verses 24 through 30. Verse number 24, he says, So defile not ye yourselves in any of these things, for in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. And the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, neither any of your own nation, nor any stranger that sojourneth among you. For all these abominations have the men of the land done done, which were before you, and the land is defiled. I want you to notice very quickly, the land is defiled. That's why heaven and earth, uh, this earth will pass away, because sin, because of man, sin has corrupted all, not just man, but the entire earth. That is the beasts of the field, that is the veg vegetation, everything is corrupted and will be destroyed because of the sin of man. He says, for all these abominations were the men of the land done, which were before you, or have the men of the land done which were before you, and the land is defiled. That the land spew not you out also when ye defile it, as it spewed out the nations that were before you. For whosoever shall commit any of these abominations, even the souls that commit them shall be cut off from among their people. Therefore shall ye keep mine ordinance, that ye commit not any one of these abominable customs which were committed before you, and that ye defile not yourselves therein. Again he says, I am the Lord your God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we come to you earnestly seeking your face of approval upon the message and upon the songs and upon these prayers and the worship that's been offered. Father, if you do not approve, then we worship in vain, then we speak in vain, then we sing and then we pray in vain. So Father, I ask humbly, Lord, that you would visit upon us, that you would manifest your presence, that you would delight in the words and in the prayers of your saints today. Father, bring us to a place of repentance if need be. Father, bring us to contrition, understanding that we are unworthy to stand before you. We are unworthy to have any kind of guiltless proclamation upon us because of the imputed righteousness of Christ. But Lord, we revel in your glory and your grace, making us accepted in the Beloved. So Father, I pray that you now would... Give me the words to utter through the study and through uh, whether the words that I have written or the words that will come to my mind and heart. Lord, you know the frailty of this flesh and of this mind, and you know that the, the need that I have of you to lead and to guide and direct. Father, may truth be spoken, may it be received, and we pray that in all of these things we may glorify the name of Jesus Christ and that your Holy Spirit again would lead us and guide us. Father, we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Today we're going to address a few major Bible themes that we find underlying the chapter before us as we continue our study in the book of Leviticus. Now if you recall, when we expounded upon chapter 17 months ago, we noted that there was a division in the book. And 17, chapter 17 was the central chapter in the book. Chapters 1 through 16, as we examined, dealt primarily with the public worship rituals of the Israelites, from the burnt offering all the way up to the exposition of the Day of Atonement in chapter 16. 
while chapters 18 through 27 deal more with the personal lifestyle regulations of the children of Israel. So you have the first half of the book dealing primarily with public ritual worship and communion, and then the second half dealing with the personal habits and behavior of the holy nation, of the individual believers. And among the types and foreshadows of our Savior, we have before us in the book of Leviticus a paradigm that promotes the importance of not only collective sanctified worship of God's people, but also His concern for their personal lifestyle and conduct as a sanctified people or a holy people. That is a people, not perfect people, that is a people set apart for His honor and His glory. Now before addressing these three major implications found in this chapter, I don't want to pass over the assertion here that is made in verses 1 through 2 and that the chapter concludes with where He says, I am the Lord your God, concerning God's authority and His sovereignty that precedes the instruction given. Let's look at verses 1 through 2 once again. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. And so we see that He begins the statement by uh, instructing Moses to articulate to the people of God, Remember, I am the Lord your God. And He concludes the discourse by the same thing. He says, I am the Lord your God. So before Moses gives instruction, or pardon me, before God gives instruction to Moses or to Aaron that is to be related to the rest of Israel, the Lord begins by declaring His authority and His Lordship. Andrew Bonar wrote, The Lord prefaces the laws He is to lay down in this chapter by very solemn declarations of His sovereignty. I am Jehovah, and of His reaction to them as reconciled to God, I am your God. He sets before them His authority and His constraining love. He knows our frame and He sees that man resents interference with his liberty and the things of daily life and private actions really more than anything else. Therefore to silence objection and to draw the will, He adduces the argument of His sovereignty and love. I like what Mr. Bonar says there. He says that what uh, the Lord is getting ready to do is He's getting ready to address the personal actions of sinful people. And so He begins by stating something that is uh, all of it is fact, but He begins by stating His authority. So as if to say, look, there's no argument. I'm going to say some things that you might disagree with. I'm going to say some things that's going to contradict your inclinations of your flesh. But I'm the Lord your God, so ye obey and you do as I say. He goes on to say, besides nothing is so direct fitted to subdue lust as a full recognition of the glorious Godhead. I like this in His presence in the soul. He says, the presence of God in its sweetness and blessedness causes a holy, heavenly satisfaction in the soul that altogether banishes impure desire. Now we're going to return to that thought later, but reminding us that, hey, I'm here with you. I am the Lord your God. And when we remember that God indwells within us by virtue of Christ, His Holy Spirit within us, as He says, it will dispel. When we are reminded of that on a daily basis, it will dispel those lusts and those carnal affections that we have. And we will be inclined unto godliness. You want the cure for your lust. You want the cure for your temptations. You want the cure for your seasons of disappointment, discouragement, anger, hostility, bitter, all of those things. Remember Christ dwells within you. Remember the Lord is present within you. Now by way of introduction, and rather than adding a point to proceed the three that we're going to discuss... We must affirm by God's Word once again that our God is an acting, governing God. And uh, really to state what we state often from this pulpit, God is sovereign, but that means that God is Lord and He is our supreme governor who accomplishes His will in our lives. God gives laws and commands and is expected to be revered and obeyed. And then briefly, rather than spend a great deal of time expounding the sovereignty of God in both the Old and the New Covenant periods, what the modern saint must glean from this truth is that the only answer to any command issued by God should be, Yes, Lord. The only answer that any are to respond with is, Yes, Lord. Now we're going to delve into the nature of the Old Testament laws, and Lord willing, we're going to see their relevance to the post-cross child of God. But the child of God, nevertheless, has an obligation to obey God, to keep His words, and to revere Him for who He is, that is the revealed God of creation and the Lord of glory. Now in this message... 
due to what is being pronounced and some vernacular that is used, we have a wonderful opportunity, as I was sharing with Brother Roger this morning, we have a wonderful opportunity to answer some very important questions as it pertains to our faith. Questions that really demand an answer. Terms that need to be defined that I believe have been muddied by both the antinomians and the legalists, and we could even throw in hyper-dispensationalists of our modern day. And we may, if time permits, look at the pitfalls of both. And so, aside from noting the assumption of God's sovereignty in the first two verses, we're going to view and summarize three things this morning. We're going to view and summarize three things. Now, many of you probably are hoping that I get into some of this immorality as we deal with the, the, the immoral sins of homosexuality and fornication in our culture, but we'll deal with that primarily, but I, I want to show you why these things are wrong. I want to show you why. And we're going to look at three things, and I believe we have a golden opportunity to do so, because, you know, certain terms are thrown out. If you recall, in my very first message in the book of Leviticus, back in April of 2017, I began by just giving you some words with which you were to be familiar. Words like atonement, propitiation, expiation, terms that we use from behind this pulpit that sometimes we don't, or we, <laughs> I don't take the time to define as I use them. And to my shame, I, I should probably define them a little bit more often so that we all understand, okay? So I'm going to give you some things, some definitions of terms that we find here that are often used so that the next time they're used, you'll have a better understanding of exactly what we're speaking of. So we're going to look at three things, probably I say three things, we're going to look at two things this morning. Um, number one, we're going to see the three, or pardon me, we're going to see a clear distinction or a distinction between the covenant of works and the covenant of grace. Number two, we're going to see three distinctions of old covenant laws and their relevance to New Testament saints. Now, we may touch on it, we may not, but we'll definitely deal with it next week, and that will be the third point, what true holiness is and what true holiness is not, okay? So we're going to look and define the terms covenant of works, covenant of grace. We're going to see the three distinctions of Old Testament law. And then we're going to look at what holiness is and what holiness is not. So first of all, let's begin by the distinction between the covenant of works and the covenant of grace. Now, as we endeavor to expound further into our study of Leviticus, it's necessary that we take a moment and address a very important teaching that we see in verse number 5, where he says, Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. So we see what we have is a prerequisite of blessing here for the children of Israel. That is, if you do, then you will receive this, right? If you will do this, then you will live. If you keep my commands, you will live and you won't die. And such is a requisite of many of the issuances of the Lord that He makes in the Old Testament. And whenever such a requisite is stated, it's very important that we see this. If you do this, I do this. Or if I do this, you must do that. Whenever such a requisite is stated, it shows us that God is establishing a covenant of works. God is establishing a covenant of works. That means that the only way the blessing can be received, now this is vital, okay? The only way that said blessing can be received is that both parties keep the covenant. Both parties keep the covenant. And we see how much of this in the book of Leviticus. Now, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but it is a principle that is often misunderstood as it pertains to not only eternal life, but the biblical principle of holy living. The biblical principle of holy living. What is also important to understand is that the redemption... Now, this, is, this may go against some things that we've thought, uh, but not the tenor of Scripture, but that the redemption of God's people, even in the Old Testament, the redemption of God's people even in the Old Testament Israel, never, never, never hinged upon any covenant of works. Redemption never hinged upon any covenant of works. Now, oftentimes we almost assume that Israel was saved because they were a nation to whom God gave laws. Oftentimes we assume that if they made all of the sacrifices, that if they fulfilled their end of the agreement, that God would preserve their eternal individual state. That is not so. 
Understand that God ransomed Israel from the bonds of the Egyptians before He gave them any further instruction. Before He issued forth any of His Ten Commandments. Or before He established the Levitical priesthood. And what did He do this upon? The, um, upon what basis did He do this? He, he did this upon the basis of the covenant that He made with Abraham and to the seed of Abraham way back in Genesis chapter 12, which would come through the preservation of the race. And that was the covenant between the seed of Abraham and Abraham, the seed of Abraham being Jesus Christ, uh, uh, upon which our salvation hinges. Gen Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. We find this similar vernacular based upon this covenant also in Genesis chapter 13, chapter 15, and chapter 17. This covenant was a promise to Abraham that from his seed would come a great nation of people of every kindred and every tongue and every tribe. I say a nation of people and many nations from every kindred and every tongue, every tribe. It is rearticulated in Genesis 17 verses 4 through 7 as he says, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. Have you ever noticed that whenever God changes a person in the Old Testament there, or whenever He gives them a, a, articulates a covenant, He changes their name? For instance, Jacob to Israel, Abram to Abraham. And we see that. Saul to Paul. Neither shall thy name be Abram, but shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy side after thee, and their generations, an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. We understand that from the seed of Abraham came our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is He who, because of the blood of the new covenant, is able to bring together Jewish and Gentile nations into one body. So never take for granted that because one was an Israelite in the Old Testament, that they were saved. Don't take that for granted. It's important that we see that. Any sacrifice they made, any covenant they kept, was a showing forth of a promise that was to come. And in that was a declaration of their faith in that promise. Abraham believed God, and that was accounted unto him for righteousness. And so it's very important that we see this, lest we fall into the trap of what is known as hyper-dispensationalism, which, which decrees that God, throughout the course of time created different means and methods for the redemption of His people. No, the redemption has always been the same by grace, through faith, in His promise. Amen. And we must see that. So because you are an Israelite, just because you would bring your, your sacrifice to the altar once a year did not necessarily mean that your eternal soul was preserved. Paul says twice and James says once that, that this is the ground of Abraham's salvation where he says Abraham believed God and it, that is his belief, was counted unto him for righteousness. Now the reason for this is that this covenant has its roots in another covenant. This covenant he made with Abraham has its roots in another covenant. The same that was the ground for the covenant that God made with Noah. The same that was the ground for the covenant that He made with David. Whether it was to spare Noah from the imminent doom of the earth or to make uh, the, uh, or the kingship of David in the Davidic covenant. And none had any confidence or any ground in the works of any of those men in order to be fulfilled. Those were not do this and receive this covenant. It was not, Noah, if, you, if you're faithful, if you do good, then I'm going to do this for you. No, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, right? God chose Noah to build the ark and to spare those eight from the impending doom. David was a shepherd boy tending sheep. He wasn't looking for anything. God made of him the next king of Israel. And furthermore, even when those men failed and David failed, right... 
Noah sinned. It did not nullify the agreement. Why? Because those were founded in the covenant of grace, the covenant of redemption. That is the agreement within the Godhead that the Father would appoint His Son to give up His life for mankind. That is what that means. That is what that is founded in. That is what those point to and show. Titus 1, 1 through 4 says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness and hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, notice this, which God that cannot lie, promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me, according to the commandment of God our Savior, to Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. So we see that God established a covenant with Jesus Christ God from the foundation of the world and we see this, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me and him that cometh me I will in no wise cast out. If any man be in Christ he's a new creature. When were we in Christ? The Bible says from the foundation of the world because the Father made an agreement with the Son that in the fullness of time he would come forth and he would fulfill all of the promises. He would fulfill all of the shadows of covenant for instance, the Abrahamic covenant that pointed to grace, the Noahic covenant that pointed to grace, the Davidic covenant that pointed to grace, and he would fulfill them in Christ Jesus. So those are all part. Now we can get off on all sorts of theology and say, well, this covenant, that covenant, but let me just break it down and make it very simple. Those are all part of one covenant, and that is the covenant of God's grace. Amen. Because that is the only thing that backs those promises. And those do not hinge upon any work that you you could ever do. Therefore, by any work that I could do, neither nullifies nor gains me any favor with God. <clears throat> the covenant of redemption is the covenant of grace, and again is the basis for the biblical covenants that God made individually with Noah, Abraham, David. Whereas <clears throat> salvation is by grace through faith, not of any work that we could do or by any ability to do and live, which is the basis of the covenants that man clearly cannot keep. So what we have here in our text, let me say that, is not part of that covenant. Because there is a condition here that needs to be met and cannot be met by sinful men. Amen. Whereas this covenant, the Mosaic covenant, which this is part of that, and the Edenic covenant... You know what the Edenic Covenant would be? The Garden of Eden? That is, of all of the treats... Uh, treats. Well, I guess... I don't know if they had Skittles and peanut butter cups out there. Well, I, in fact, I know they did it because those things are a result of the curse. Amen? Um, of all of the tree, trees of the garden you may freely eat... But of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, that is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not freely eat. For in the day that ye eat thereof, ye shall what? Ye shall surely die. So, hey, look, you want to live in bliss? You want to live in a state of innocence? Have at it. Enjoy what I've given to you. Just don't eat of that one tree. Why? Because you will die. Do this and live. Do that and die. You see, that's a conditional that is a conditional covenant. The Mosaic covenant, what we have here, do this and live, or don't do this and die. These are based upon the covenant of works. Now let's use Adam as an example in the Garden of Eden. Again, an, an agreement that was made between God and Adam and promised life for obedience and death for disobedience. Adam disobeyed God. Adam broke that covenant. And so because of that, mankind fell with Adam. Romans 5, 12 through 14. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there's no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that did not sin after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. And so because of Adam's inability to keep this covenant, man fell. The covenant was nullified. Do this and live. He didn't do it. He disobeyed. It's over. You've brought death upon all men. So we must understand, and it's vital that we do so, that any covenant of works, again, do this and I'll do this, or abstain from this and I will do this or that, has never been, nor ever will be, the basis of salvation for sinful man. 
That is why salvation is by grace, through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So because we could never be saved by keeping the covenant of works, because Adam already destroyed that opportunity for us. Right? Adam destroyed that opportunity for us. So no matter how good you are, in our third point, we're going to see something that should be staggering to a lot of us who are high and lifted up and mighty. You will never, if you are a child of God, if you've been redeemed, you will never be holier than you are right now. You'll never be holier than you are right now. Because there's no good thing that you can do that can ever gain salvific favor with God. Salvation is not according to works. Because no man has ever been able to be saved by the covenant of works. Therefore, there is a covenant of grace that God made with the Son. You see, Abraham's covenant was a covenant that God made with the seed of Abraham. That is Jesus Christ, who could do all of the things that you couldn't do. Amen. The second Adam, who could do what the first Adam could not do. So what then is the purpose of such commands that we see here then. If this is not about salvation, if we cannot keep this and live, what is the purpose of such laws? What is the purpose of the Mosaic Law? Why have we spent so much time, and we will spend much more time, expounding and dealing with this ancient Old Testament text? Well, for two primary reasons. First of all, the law is given to reveal man's inability and reveal his need of grace. This is given so that it shows us just who we really are. And it reminds us of our inability. The institution of biblical Old Testament law and the whole purpose of the covenant of works is to show that God has righteous demands that need to be kept because He's holy and He's righteous and no sin can ever enter into His presence. He is so meticulous and He covers all of the bases and, he may, and, and it is impossible for men to please Him in this regard because one speck of sin, one imperfection, one iota of transgression, one small blemish could not be accepted by God and therefore would plunge all men as it did one act of disobedience plunged all men into hell. It didn't matter that how long Adam, and we can debate how long he was in the garden. I really don't care if it was a million years. We can debate how long, probably not very long because I know it doesn't take me very long. We could debate that all day long, but the fact of the matter is it didn't matter all of the good that he did. It didn't matter that he tended to the garden, that he did all of these other things. One act of disobedience, because no sin can stand in the presence of God. Thus the need for grace and mercy. Now, it is my sincere conviction, and I, I believe you would agree with me, it is my sincere conviction that Jesus Christ not only fulfilled the covenant of grace by condescending to earth to redeem man based entirely upon his submission to the will of the Father and not the merit of men, but he also fulfilled that covenant of works, Amen. which necessitates perfect obedience to God's laws and promises life to any who kept them. So when I look at this passage and I say, see, do this and live, I see a man who did this, and my life is in him. So I don't get shook up about the covenant of works or having to make sure I do it and keep it in order to maintain my standing before God. Christ did what Adam could not do to etern obtain eternal bliss in the garden, and He did what the Israelites could never do by keeping the laws, ordinances, and commands of God that we find here in the book of Leviticus. Romans 5, 15-18 shows us this. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, speaking of Adam, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, and he emphasizes man, Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many, because Christ did all of this in his humanity. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. 
Christ, by the full obedience to God's demands, satisfied God's need, and by His work imputes His righteousness to the account of God's people in order to provide us a standing before God. So He fulfilled the covenant of grace because God made the covenant with Him. The promise was in Him and He did what God asked Him to do by yielding, by becoming obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And He fulfilled the covenant of, the, of works because all of those promises that God would keep if the Israelites would, would keep them, if Adam kept them, Christ kept because they could never do that. So we see, first of all, why the law was given to reveal man's inability, to reveal his need of grace, right? The law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. But secondly, and practically, the covenants of works serve to show forth the sanctification of God's people. It doesn't sanctify us. It shows that we are sanctified. That make sense? It identifies us as God's people. You see, what we see that is practical for us as New Testament believers is that these holy rules that God established placed a difference between God's people and the rest of the world. We see over and over in our text, ye shall not do as the Egyptians from whose land ye came, and ye shall not do as the Canaanites in whose land you are going to. Don't do as the heathen around you. Don't partake of their abominations. Don't live in the carnality of the flesh. Don't be a hedonist. Don't be a humanist. Don't satisfy all of the carnal desires because that's what they do. And you are a holy people that are called to reflect my holiness. Amen. And because you are sanctified, and I like what Bonar writes there, and let me say that again, we do not follow God's ways. We do not reflect His righteousness and His holiness because we feel the constraint to do so, because we feel that we have to keep this covenant of works. Nay, we do it because Christ lives within us, and with the presence of God constrains us to be more like Him. And if God is a morally perfect, pure, ethical, just, equitable being, then we ought to be so as well. And we ought to want to be so. It identifies us with Him. I don't want to be identified with the hedonists of the world. We ought to be, I want to be identified with Jesus Christ. So we see number one, the distinction between the covenant of works and the covenant of grace. And I hope that clears up anything in case I am to ever use that terminology. Again, in light of scriptural truth, typically we look at what the scripture says and we just agree with it and we believe it. Uh, whether or not we want to put certain titles or throw classifications around, that's neither here nor there. We're not theology majors. We're children of God, Christians who want to learn more about Him. And those are things that have been imparted by man and that's okay that they they are, but just in case you ever hear that, that's what that is, okay? Now let's look at three distinctions of Old Covenant law. Definitely not going to get to holiness today. Three distinctions of Old Covenant law and their relation to New Covenant saints. So we see that right here in chapter 18, based upon verse number 5, he's dealing with conditional covenant. Do this and live. It's not salvific. It's conditional covenant. Now let's look at the three distinctions of Old Covenant law. Now what we need to note immediately is something that is oft articulated from this pulpit and really the crux of the whole message, and that is that Jesus Christ utterly and completely fulfilled the law of God. Now, we're going to break it down and we're going to see the three divisions of Old Covenant law. But each division, one, two, three, understand first off that Christ fulfilled it all. Christ fulfilled it all. He said in Matthew 5.17... Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And we thank God that He did. Because through that we can obtain His righteousness, which declares us guiltless and acceptable unto God. This is the work of justification and reconciliation. Romans 3, 23-38 explains this, this truth quite thoroughly. For all have sinned, come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, 
whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remissions of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is the boasting then? It's excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Amen. Without the deeds of the law. Why? No matter what, how we classify it, we're never justified by the law. The Israelites were never justified by the law. Nobody will ever be justified by the law. So when we come to these principles laid out before us in the Old Testament, what do we do with them? <laughs> if this isn't about justification and Christ fulfilled these all, what do I do with them? Do we, because Christ lived that perfect life in obedience to God's law, then we, do we disregard all standards of morality and godly principles found in the Old Testament? Some do. Some say, well, Christ fulfilled it, so we disregard it. We have no use for it. We come to Leviticus and we talk about the abomination of these sexual acts. People say, well, that's Old Testament. Do we, so do we disregard it? That's a good question. It's a good question to ask since Christ fulfilled it. But on the other hand, do we still seek to keep them as a standard of righteousness? So what do we do? Do we throw them out completely because Christ fulfilled them? Or do we keep them as a standard of righteousness? I'm going to shock you with this answer. Neither one. Neither one. We don't keep them as a standard of righteousness and we don't throw them out. Let me explain. We know that prior to Christ, we are under the law. Right? We are under the law. As Paul st states, that he was sold under sin. So you see that preposition there, under. What that denotes is that under the law, we are subject to its rule and to its consequences. Right? Even in the civil law here, you see that there are consequences, dire consequences, stoning for children who disobeyed and disregarded their parents' instruction. So under the law, if we are under the law, that means that we are under its rule and under its consequences. In like manner, if we are under sin, that means we are under the reign of sin and its consequences as well. Being under sin as well as being under the law bears a negative consequence. However, because of Christ's work in redeeming from sin and the curse of the law, souls in Him are no longer under the law, but under Christ. We are under His reign. We are not under the law. We are not under, the, under sin. Praise God for that. Because we believe in what's known as Lordship Salvation. We believe that Jesus Christ, there are two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of Satan. There's the kingdom of Christ. And we are in His kingdom if we are saved. We are under Him. <clears throat> we are dead to the law, right? We are unified then to another law. That is the law of Christ. As one writer put it, the law of Christ is not an external standard that we are under, but an inward reality written on our hearts and empowered by Christ's life within us. And then we speak about soul liberty, when we speak about what Christ makes us when we're redeemed, when He justifies us, and this is good stuff, soul. So you understand what liberty is when He justifies us, when He calls us, and when His Holy Spirit dwells within us and releases us from the bondage of sin and sets us free from the law, whereas the law meant death and sin meant condemnation. We are now under the headship of Christ. We are His and we follow His law, which is written upon our hearts. I'm not under the law. I'm not under sin. I'm under Christ and under His authority. He reigns over me. And that's where we are as children of God. And so I am not obligated to do anything to merit my salvation. I never was. You see, the law showed me my need of a new master. The law showed me my need of a new king, of a greater one that could rule and reign my life. Amen. That's why you cannot have a redeemer without having a king. Amen. Now with that in our minds, notice that there are three distinctions within the Mosaic law or three categories. We're going to make them applicable. Okay? And we're giving them in order to show forth not only the depths of Christ's ability, but so that we have a practical understanding as to what they mean for us as New Covenant believers. And that's important because we could look to all that is spoken in the New Old Testament and find it irrelevant. 
But God forbid that we find any of His truth irrelevant. As we've said many times, and I will affirm it, Lord willing, unto death, every book in this Bible, old or new, is applicable to you as a New Testament believer. As well, understanding this division is vital to how we perceive Christ and how we live our lives. Okay, So this is an important message. It's going to educate you. First, there are three divisions of biblical law. First of all, ceremonial law. Now, the ceremonial laws were those laws that God required of the Israelites that showed forth His salvation. For instance... And we went over this. The sermons are on Sermon Audio, 30-some-odd sermons dating back all the way to April of last year in Leviticus. We saw the burn offerings, the peace offerings, the sin offerings, etc. Remember, they denoted the depths of Christ's sacrifice and that He was a propitiation for sin. Uh, he expiates sin, vicarious substitute, blood atonement, and so forth. The feasts and the Day of Atonement that God required the Israelites to observe, part of the ceremonial law. The abstinence of meats and the practice of circumcision are all categorized under ceremonial law. All those rituals that we examined that made worship and communion between God and His people possible. There's rituals, those ceremonies. They were a foreshadowing of Christ's coming and atonement. The shedding of blood and the offering upon the altars typified the sacrifice of Jesus who would finally and fully satisfy God's need so that man could be redeemed in the future. That's what those pointed to. The Word of God clearly denotes the cessation of these in the New Testament with the coming of Christ, or with the sacrifice of Christ. As Hebrews, understand, if you're ever going to do a study in biblical law, if you're ever going to do a study in ceremonial law, you need to study Hebrews too. You need to study Hebrews as well, because Hebrews is the fulfillment of that. And the writer of Hebrews says, look, the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. All of those ceremonial laws, if we're going to go back to observing feasts and circumcision and all of those things, we need to go back to sacrificing bullocks and rams and lambs and, and, and all of that stuff as well, because it's all pointing to the salvation of Jesus Christ and His blood atonement. And the Bible says that once He came... That was completed. In fact, we see that in Hebrews 9, 8 through 12. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which we were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and cardinal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. You see, all of the, the abstinence of meat and drink and the washings, you know, remember the cleansing and, and unclean, those stood only until the time of Reformation. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by His own blood He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So we see all of that was fulfilled in Christ's sacrifice. And I would say the pitfall of legalism is that the legalist still believes the observance of certain feasts, the abstinence of certain meats, the shunning of certain things deemed unclean, and the practice of circumcision are necessary for redemption. And they exist today. They exist today. There's something called a Hebrew Roots Movement. I don't have time to get into that, but it's an abomination. It's of Satan. And it negates the finished work of Jesus Christ. And I hate, capital H-A-T-E, anything that negates the finished work of Jesus Christ. And we should have no part in it. Romans 2, 28-29, For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Acts 10, 14-15, But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him, this is his vision, again the second time, saying, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. Now the example of meats is used in Peter's vision to refer to 
to Gentiles, and it is used as, a, as an example because God cleansed all the meats. Even Paul condemns those who would force others back into such practice. In 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, he says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisies, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused. If it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. It's cleansed. We don't need to be bound to that anymore. Why is this dangerous? Again, because it negates the full sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So we see the ceremonial law, part of the Mosaic law. The second category of God's law is the civil law, or as some put it, the judicial code. This law was given to Israel as a theocratic nation which reflected the justice of God and provided order for the people. Now, as a nation, as a nation, laws had to be established. Any governing nation has to have laws, right? This code is based off of God's moral code dealing with man's dealings with other men. Such was necessary so that order and justice would be established in the nation. For instance, let me give an example. We're running out of time, but I don't have very much longer, okay? Let me give you an example of the judicial code or the civil law. Exodus 21, 22 through 28. If men strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give him life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. And if a man smite the eye of his servant or the eye of his maid, that it perish, he shall let him go free for his eye's sake. And if he smite out, of his man, out his manservant's tooth or his maidservant's tooth, he shall let him go free for his tooth's sake. If an ox gore a man or a woman that they die, then the ox shall surely be stoned, and his flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall be quit. Now, I, that's just a, a small example. If you go through the Old Testament, you're going to see, see a lot of that. Okay? But that shows us that that is how God governed by laws His nation. Why? Well, it reflects the justice and the equity of God. Amen. That's why it is important, because it reflects His moral, holy nature. Now look, I'll say this, there is debate concerning whether or not the civil code is relevant in our society today, as the New Testament does not issue a clear abrogation. Some would contend that this civil code was never given to any Gentile nation, and it is not re-articulated in the New Testament as code required of Gentile nations. Therefore, it is irrelevant. So let us be reminded that Israel is God's people. Israel is God's people. This does not have to do with the U.S. of A. This does not have to do with the Republic of Canada or whatever they are. This does not have to do with North Korea or South Korea or democracy. This has to do with God's people. And so what this shows us, it shows us that as a spiritual nation of God's people, we are to be an equitable and just society. We should deal fairly with one another. That's how the civil law here in the Word of God can be applicable to us. Ceremonial law, Christ fulfilled. Hebrews says that civil law we can look at and we can see God's equity. We can see God's dealings with men. And as God's people, we are to conduct ourselves justly, to love mercy. We find no directive in the New Testament to forcibly impose this Old Testament civil standard upon the physical nation in which we live. Again, conjecture could be made, hypotheticals can be expressed, I've read them, but there is no clear directive. However, there is a directive to submit to authority. Now, with that said, do I think that basing laws in our land off the moral code is a good thing? Absolutely. Do I think we should pray and seek opportunity to influence our government and the laws of God? Without a doubt. But this is not the directive of the Lord's church. This is not to take Washington by storm. This is not to impose the civil law. This law was for God's people. It was for them. So we see the ceremonial law. We see the civil law. Now most importantly, I know you're getting tired. We have the moral law or the moral code. 
The moral law is the law that God set forth in the Old Testament that displays or reflects God's own purity and righteousness. For example, the Ten Commandments, which highlight the responsibility of man both to God and to other men. They are a reflection of God's moral being. Christ did fulfill the moral code because Christ is the express image of God and by His full revelation we glean a deeper understanding of the moral code and of the morality of God. For example, God's seventh commandment to the Israelites at Sinai found in Exodus 20 verse 14 plainly states, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Of course, this shows forth God's holiness. And then Jesus comes along and He gives a deeper view in Matthew 5, 27-28 when He doesn't say the moral code, I fulfilled it so it's no longer relevant, but He says look, you've heard that it was said of them of old time ye shall not commit adultery, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So we see by New Testament, Christ does not go back to judicial code. He does not go back to ceremonial code, but He does go back to moral code. And He does say that though I fulfilled it, let me show you a new law, so to speak. Let me show you greater depth because you see, you cannot separate God's righteous law in the Old Testament from who Jesus Christ is. Because Christ was the embodiment of it and Christ was a fuller, deeper revelation of God's morality. And if we are to be more like Him, then we are to follow Christ's law. That's why, listen, teach the kid, your kids the Ten Commandments. Teach it to them. Learn, tell them to love the commands of God. But I tell you this, that we would do better. We would, we would be served better if we go to the teachings of Christ because it offers a fuller, clearer visage of who God is. Amen. That's the law of Christ. He is the full revelation of God's moral being. And for such reason, I stated moments ago that the moral law, though it is perfect and righteous, is not the standard of righteousness for us as New Testament saints. Remember I said don't use the moral law as, as your standard of righteousness? Why? Because it's not good enough. You say it's not good enough? No, because Christ is a fuller embodiment of the morality of God. Use Christ as your standard. And so this lends not the, to the antinomian view that says, well, we just throw out the law. We look at that. We have no standard. We can do whatever we want. Nay, I tell you this, that when we look to Jesus Christ, the perfect standard of righteousness, we will not do those things of the flesh, but we will see just how much sin displeases our holy God. Amen. And we have a higher standard. Charles Leiter wrote, he said, To focus on the Ten Commandments as our standard of righteousness while the full blaze of Christ's own glory shines before us is like turning from the sun to gaze at a candle. Amen. Therefore, even though Christ is the fulfillment, and unlike the ceremonial and civil codes, the moral law is still very relevant because it reflects God's morality and holiness. And if that were to ever change, then God would have to change. And while morality cannot save, and we don't preach moralism here, it certainly exemplifies godliness. Amen. Christ lived morally in accordance with God's standards, and if we are to be like Christ, this will be our desire. Also, unlike the ceremonial law and the judicial law, God's standard of morality... And here's the nail in the coffin. God's standard of morality, while, listen, the judicial and the ceremonial codes were not imposed upon Canaan, Sodom, Gomorrah, they sure were judged because of God's moral code. For instance, in verse 28 of our text, I know we've not spent a lot of time in our text, so much for expository preaching, huh? That the land spew not you out also when you defile it as it spewed out the nations that were before you. It is clear that God judged other nations by His standard of righteousness. Let no man say, as many of the hyperarmenians would say, that the only sin we are judged for is disbelief or rejection of Christ. Lie, lie, lie. We are judged because of unrighteousness. Because we are sinners from head to toe. Consider the earth during the time of Noah, Sodom, Gomorrah, and so on. Though they were not given the law of God, they were judged by the very same things that we see here in Leviticus 8, 18. Sexual immorality. 
We see that God held the Canaanites accountable for immorality in verse number 3 of our text. He said, After the doings of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwell, ye shall not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I brought, bring you, ye shall not do. Neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. And in elsewhere in Scripture, it is clear that God judges those who break this law. In the New Testament... Christ is the standard of righteousness, and men are judged against Him. Romans 2, 14-16 For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. That is the moral law. The work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. And the day when God shall judge the secrets of men, by whom? <laughs> By the law? No. Even more frightening. By Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. As well, we see in the New Testament church that God still requires men to live righteously. We see a prohibition against sexual immorality and fornication in 1 Corinthians 5.1. That's not changed, and that's New Testament. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. So this is not abrogated, dear soul. Paul does not appeal to the judicial code and call for an, the offender to be turned over to the local officials, does he? He does not say because of the judicial code or because of the civil law that, that we have to take care of this. He doesn't appeal to that. He doesn't appeal to the ceremonial law. He doesn't say because this offender has, has, has committed this sin that we need to offer a burnt offering or a sin offering. No, he appeals to the moral code. So again, while Christ is the fulfillment of the moral law, it does not mean that we have no moral law. Amen. While a refusal to let go of the ceremonial law, such as keeping the feasts and circumcision, is the pitfall of legalism, getting rid of the moral law is the pitfall of antinomianism. And that just simply means no law, which is a pitfall among many sovereign grace Baptists of our day. Do what you want to do. Christ fulfilled it all. No need. I disagree with that. I disagree. I don't do any of those things because I keep my salvation. But we want to live that way because Christ loves us and gave Himself for us. Now I said all of that to say this. As I conclude, I'm going to get to our text. All of that to say this. What we have in our text is not an in-depth look at the civil law. It's not an in-depth look at the, or at the ceremonial law, but it is an in-depth look into the prohibition related to God's moral law. Therefore, the prohibitions that we see here, and I didn't read them. We've got children present. I want to be wise and I want to be prudent, but most of these children have heard of some of these perversions or have witnessed it in our society, which include... Adultery, incest, bestiality, homosexuality, all of them. You say that's Old Testament law? It's moral code. That's what it is. And so therefore, it is not acceptable. It is unacceptable. How do I know this? Well, we can see how these relate to the first, fifth, sixth, and the seventh commandment. Is adultery with another man's wife still prohibited? Yes, 1 Corinthians 5.1, we saw that. Is homosexuality and other sexual perversion still an abomination? Yes, it is, along with idolatry, covetousness, and disrespect for parents. We see in Romans 1, 26 through, 20, through 32, the exemplary reprobate, where it says, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge... God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, desp despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents without understanding, covenant breakers without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, they commit such things and are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. 
oftentimes we like to, and, and we're, we're good at doing it because it's so easy for us for some reason, we like to pick out maybe one of those, and we all know which one. But listen, there's a lot more depth here. Many times because we don't have to personally deal with that. But there's a lot more depth here. And Christ said, Whosoever looketh after a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery in his heart already. We don't have to go back here when we go to Christ and we see a deeper reflection of God's code. And we have a desire to live up to His standard. So, beloved, I, I pray and I trust after much words here this morning that it's been made very clear that we as God's children, number one, we are saved, we are redeemed because of His covenant of grace. Because of His mercy. Not because we could do any or all of these things. I'd say most of them we cannot. And regardless of, of that, we understand that we still have an obligation to righteousness. We still have an obligation to obedience. We still have an obligation to be like Christ. And I would contend vehemently that we would desire that in our lives. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for Your glory.